Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining on tonight. We'll wait a little bit until more people trickle in. We will go ahead and get started in another minute or so. We'll wait for some more people to um, come in and then we'll get the ball rolling. We can go ahead and get started. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in tonight. We're so excited um, to have you all. Um, tonight, we're going to be chatting about how to succeed as a business candidate in college admissions. I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. So my name is Jillian Shank. I am an enrollment counselor, um, as well as a marketing and business development associate here at Ingenious Prep. Um, I actually got my undergraduate degree at the Kelly School of Business at Indiana University in marketing. Um, and part of my job is to bring value to you guys and to, of course, um, explain how this process works, how our services work, and how we can help you. Um, and now I will go ahead and let my colleague Raheel introduce himself. Hi, everyone. My name is Raheel Masood, uh, and I work at Ingenious as a former admissions officer. And um, this is something that um, I really enjoy. Um, I grew up here in Pakistan uh, and, you know, I went to college in the U.S. I have an undergraduate degree in economics. I went to Reed College in Oregon and graduated from Allegheny. Um, and then I worked in New York for a while, but always knew I wanted to get a business degree. And so I did my MBA at the American University in Washington. After graduation from my MBA, I did what every good MBA does, which is going to the consulting world. And, and I did that. But 
there's always a passion to go into education because I love my college years and my graduate school. So when Georgetown had an opportunity to join their admissions office, I did that. And I did that for many years before becoming director of admissions of an art school, uh, which is now part of GW called the Portland College of Art. Um, eventually, I decided to come back home to Pakistan and get involved in education here, but I kept counseling students on college applications throughout the years. Um, one of the unique things was that, you know, I worked as chair of the transfer committee, but also the chair of the business school committee at Georgetown, which is why um, these kind of seminars are um, something that I enjoy doing because over the years I've had not only uh, many students apply as a counselor to business schools, but also I've been on the other side of the equation. And, and um, you know, I've been fortunate enough as part of my Georgetown experience to travel with Harvard, Duke and Penn and Stanford and other great institutions. So I learned more about them. So I've, I've brought a unique perspective to the students that I counsel. And I'm fortunate with Ingenious that I've worked with students from all over the world. And Jillian and I were just talking about the fact that uh, with the time differences, my um, counselees span the globe uh, from uh, the United States and South America all the way to New Zealand and uh, Singapore and Korea. And, and so it's a very interesting um, opportunity. Uh, hopefully tonight uh, we'll be able to help you understand the process, get some insights, um, think about some creative ways of how to approach the process. Um, and at the end of the day, the goal is to actually do that, to help you figure out what it takes to succeed. And, um, um, you know, we'll have the presentation followed by questions and answers. And, you know, I'm happy to take uh, whatever questions you have about the process or something else. So I'll turn it back to Jillian's capable hands to get us through um, the, the rest of the presentation. Okay, sounds great. Thank you so much, Raheel. Um, so we're going to get started. If you could, sometime throughout the presentation, if you could just answer this poll, um, it's just what describes you. Um, no rush, just if you could answer that at some point, that'd be great. Um, and then a little bit about um, some housekeeping. Um, I wanted to give everyone a heads, a heads up um, to please submit any questions, um, comments, or replies to the chat box. Um, you can submit questions you have for the speaker in the Q&A box, um, and we will get to those at the end of the presentation. Um, just don't raise your hand. Um, and yeah, at the end of the um, session as well, um, we will go over all the questions that you have. So don't feel worried if you you know have a quick question you want to get answered. Okay, and then what we'll cover today. So now we're going to go into some introductions. So who we are and what we do. Um, so just a little bit about Ingenious Prep. We are a college counseling company. We are based out of New Haven, Connecticut, um, but we also have team members placed all over the world, um, as Raheel was just mentioning. Um, and we are very lucky to work with former admissions officers and graduate coaches and other academic mentors um, that come from top universities across the entire world. Um, so as you can see on the screen here, we do work um, with over 150 former admissions officers from top schools. These are some of the faces of the counselors we work with. Um, you know, if you did want to work with us, you could work with counselors like Raheel and like these counselors um, on the screen. We do work with over 75 graduate coaches as well from top schools, as I mentioned. Um, you know, we do have a very impressive um, counseling staff, and we're very proud of that here at Ingenious. And these are some of the professors, scholars, and researchers we also work with on our team. So we have a very large network of experts across the globe. Okay, more into kind of who we are um, in our curriculum. So we actually use a curriculum that was based off of objective insights from our over 150 former admissions officers. Um, this cutting edge curriculum was actually built from experiences of our former admissions officers. It was built from school specific insights from every top 30 university and more. Um, we also have that systematic and operational curriculum that we use on our team. And we also use this curriculum to train and manage our counseling team. Um, and so these, this curriculum is really based on all of those insights um, and expertise we have in this counseling field. Okay, now we'll dig into our results. So we're very excited about our 23, 2023 results. We're still waiting for more results to come in, of course. Um, but we've had 32 Ivy League offers so far. 
43 top 10 offers, 139 top 30 offers, 235 top 50 offers, um, 295 top 70 offers. And you can see we're, we're having fantastic results this season and we're excited um, to see as more results do come in. And then our 2022 results, we also had great results last year. We had 102 US IV and top 10 schools. We had 391 top 30 schools in the US. Um, we had 779 top 50 schools. We had 17 um, US top liberal arts colleges. Um, and so we had really great results last year as well. And we are very passionate about helping students um, reach their goals and get into their dream schools here at Ingenious. So that's a little bit about our results. And now I'm going to turn it over to Raheel and he's going to chat more about the college admissions landscape for business applicants specifically. Thanks, Jillian. Appreciate it. Okay, so let's get started. And uh, some of the first things that we like to do is get you through. Um, and you'll see this periodically. There are questions that I'll ask and then I'll answer them just so that we start. So the idea is to give you a as you see, the, the headings are the business landscape, how to build a profile, and then um, looking at some actual case studies to give you an idea of how uh, things are. And we'll talk about individual things. So as we go to the next slide, you'll see that uh, uh, one of the important things, um, Jillian, if we can go to the next slide. Okay, so the admissions data, and if you can uh, change the slide, we'll see that um, the question, thinking about it, uh, business is the most popular in the United States, um, you know, and, and the answer is um, on the next slide, absolutely. There is no doubt that uh, far and away, um, you know, towards almost two to one, it was the most uh, uh, popular major. And that comes with um, some great things, um, and it also comes with some things that make one think about how we go about getting involved with this because um, it has implications for competitiveness and other things which might be a little concerning, but it also has, um, you know, the fact that uh, because it is the most popular major, there are some great opportunities out there to get involved, and we will talk you through some of the strategies on that as well. So moving to the next slide, um, we just want to be clear about uh, what areas that we're talking about when we talk about a business degree. Um, and, and this can be, you know, because certain schools don't have a particular business school, but they have majors related to business. Uh, so basically, we're talking about any major that's related to business, and then it can even include things like statistics, which are technically math, but it's related. And you'll hear more about this later on, about the involvement of quantitative things and so on. Um, so there's a lot of uh, versatility in these majors. And and you can see that you know it covers a lot of different areas. Um, so that is an important thing to understand. Moving to the next slide now, we can, um, you know, there's, why do students choose uh, business and why is it so popular? Um, versatility is a common message that you'll hear throughout this, um, whether it's on the potential of business or whether it's on how candidates need to pre present themselves, because that is the nature of business. Um, you know, there's so many things, the flexibility um, that business offers you when you start your professional life or go to graduate school, um, you know, being able to focus on areas that you're interested in um and combine them with other things we'll talk about that too um you know and practical experience you know i think that is the um cornerstone of course other disciplines also have that but it's much easier to gain um hands-on opportunities um uh, for us you know the varied areas of business i think that's very important too um, the next thing that we're going to talk about in the next slide is, uh, you know, where do you go? Um, and I, you know, you can see the rest of them, but I like the one at the bottom. It's really that, that you can do anything you like. I mean, look, you're talking to an MBA who not only did consulting, um, you know, I did research, uh, I did, uh, you know, uh, I've done uh, college admissions, I am now the principal of an A-level college, uh, I'm a college counselor, 
Uh, so, you know, I've done statistical analysis. I've done all kinds of things. So um, it really is anything you like because business helps you build so many different skills um, that can be applied in a variety of industries. So really the sky is the limit. And um, just very quickly, sometimes, you know, I tell students, uh, you know, that are interested in a particular discipline, but then um, cannot, uh, you know, because of their academic profile, pursue that discipline. I say, well, you know, the interesting thing about something like business is that you you have to have a broad range of skills, and we'll talk about that later. And that means that a lot of different students, um, regardless of their strengths and weaknesses, can get involved with business because um, there is that versatility and uh, ability to select different niches within the business world um, that will allow you to get involved. So moving to the next slide, um, another question. Uh, what do you think? Was business always this popular or not? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the answer is that um, going back to 1970, um, except for 1975, which uh, I'm not sure why, but uh, business has been consistently uh, the most popular major. And I think it's, you know, for all the reasons we talked about and um, the ability to get involved and and the fact that, you know, business has always been at the top of everything um, the, over the years, innovation, uh, leadership, uh, creativity, financial success. Um, so it stands to reason that students would always gravitate towards that field and that uh, universities would provide opportunities uh, for business. Uh, moving to the next slide, another question. Um, Often we, you know, we get these questions as we work with our students, you know, they have concerns about various things. And this is one of the concerns because of the nature of the business world. But the answer will be hopefully providing some insight to you because the answer is actually, um, uh, if you go to the next uh, slide, um, that, you know, you'll find that the gap is much less than you think. Um, and it is evolving, uh, obviously, but um, there really isn't much difference here. I think you'll find that with the sheer number of applications going into colleges these days, that the balance is very much um, close to 50-50 or thereabouts. I mean, it's very rare, except for, of course, certain uh, unique colleges um, that you'll find a really major difference here. Uh, so I think this is this is an important part as well. So going on to our next segment. Um, so what what is the difference when you're looking at things like an undergraduate business school in particular, or looking at uh, where there is no business school and you're uh, looking at a major like economics, like I did? Um, you know, a business is a more practical way to go about things. You'll find, uh, you know, different specializations in there compared to economics, which will be a little more theoretical. However, the idea is that you'll end up at the same place when you're in terms of options beyond your academics. And I think that's the important thing here, that it doesn't matter what, uh, you know, uh, you come from uh, in terms of major, um, or what style of education you had. But at the end of the day, the basic tools that you learn, and we'll talk about those and the characteristics, um, will allow you to pursue the same wide range of career options. There is a difference, however, that um, because of the sheer number of pure business, so when you apply as a business candidate, um, it is a little more competitive than uh, applying for economics because uh, again, fewer kids apply for economics compared to business, um, and you know uh, there there are different uh, methodologies in the admissions process also. Um, so uh, that does make it, it provide a different uh, landscape for kids applying um, to either major. Uh, so I think that's an important thing to understand. Not necessarily true across the board for every school because you have to do your research. That's part of what you do. But in general, this is. Um, this is true. Um, moving to the next slide, we are going to talk a little more about um, some numbers. Okay, if you look at 
in general, and we're, we'll have another couple of lists for you. Uh, the numbers are daunting uh, compared to overall acceptance rates, even at places where um, only 15% are getting in overall, the number for Haas is 4.3. Uh, yes, Warden and Sloan, just because of the sheer nature of the institution, are very close to the overall acceptance rate, which is very low in, to begin with. But, uh, you know, uh, but you, you can see in every case, um, there is a measure of competitiveness that's higher than the overall competitiveness at these very good schools. Um, and this is done to give you a realistic perspective about the process. Going to the next slide, you'll see more schools um, that are very highly regarded, both business schools. And yes, you'll find again, look at Mendoza, it's very similar. Uh, but then you look at something like Dyson, uh, where it's very different. Uh, so, I mean, you'll find, again, when you do your research, it's important for you to look at these factors and decide, okay, which way am I going um, to apply? Do I apply for the business school or do I look at economics or uh, do I look at math or, you know, some or some joint program? Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that later in one of the application profiles. But, for example, Penn has a, the Huntsman program, which goes both between international relations and business. There are other different combinations that are out there. And that might, uh, even though Huntsman is very competitive, but there are other combinations that you can look at. Um, the next slide will talk a little more about economics. Uh, you know, I, even with economics, you'll find that it is a highly ranked major, but um, for some reason, um, you know, again, it is sometimes less competitive. I mean, it's hard to think of 13% and 4.5% being less competitive, but, um, you know, it, it might work in your favor, uh, depending on the profile that you have. And economics still does have, compared to business overall, uh, slightly fewer graduates. So that's also something to look at. So moving to the next slide. Um, what do we understand from this? Um, and it's, something that I think most people know that it is the most popular major and therefore it is very competitive uh, to apply. And part of what we're going to do in the next segment is talk about how you make yourself um, a compelling candidate, even in that highly competitive landscape. Um, so that's the next part of what we're going to discuss. And then we'll move to some case studies that show you how that actually gets implemented. Um, so one of the things that the reason I'm here is to help you understand the process. So the process will guide us um, towards how um, you uh, get to present yourself and, and what, do they, what do people look for. And uh, so the next slide will tell you sort of the basics of how an admissions officer actually reads applications. You know, students often ask me, listen, um, is it important to be strong academically or can I balance it out with other things? And, you know, I, I am the amazingly frustrating counselor who says you have to be good at everything and balance is extremely important. Um, you know, academics are always looked at very closely and it's uh, the um, and, you know, in terms of everything that you do, in terms of the strength of your curriculum, in terms of how you have pursued that academic interest you have, and obviously um, applying to university, you would expect that academics are the most important thing. The high school transcript is extremely important. Um, for some schools, the test scores become more important than for other schools because, um, you know, again, um, it really depends on uh, where you're applying and the level of competitiveness. But what's very important is because you kind of assume academics only reflect one piece of what the candidate brings to a campus. So they look at, a, you know, a lot of different things, uh, such as leadership, um, you know, the ability to consistently be involved in an activity over a period of three or four years rather than just joining it in senior year. All those things carry value, um, you know, personal attributes uh, such as leadership, um, the desire to help others, um, you know, how maybe first generation, you know, family background, uh, uh, first generation college student, 
all those things are looked at. Um, and then there are external things that um, happen. And again, uh, while sports is something that is valued for its teamwork, its ability to demonstrate commitment and, and balance uh, being a student athlete, um, sometimes uh, very high level athletes are looked at in terms of their ability to contribute to university community. But, you know, that's a sort of one or two percent uh, uh, thing. But it's it is important if if you are one of those uh, top one or two percent in a particular uh, sport, then that is also important. So these are the kinds of things that are looked at. And we'll talk in depth about some of them during the next few slides. So Going to the next slide, um, you know, so the first thing, um, when you look at a college, I mean, and Georgetown was a national university, right? So we were interested in that we wanted representation from um, all the states. We wanted to make sure that we were taking care of the fact that, uh, you know, we had schools that sent the, you know, 35 of the top 50 students to the university. So how do you evaluate those? Um, individually and otherwise, um, you know, obviously we're trying to balance the goals for every department that you're applying for. Um, and, you know, then of course, looking at different pieces of the application, you know, uh, comparing extracurriculars or research opportunities and, and uniqueness you know, and and every one of you, every every student, and I, I I say this genuinely, every student is unique. The question is not whether you are unique. You are unique. The question is how well you portray that in the admissions process. How consistent are you in your profile, and how do you uh, represent your uniqueness uh, to the university? Not manufactured, but genuinely so. And and honestly speaking, you'd be hard pressed to find two people that are the same. It's kind of like DNA, right? It, it is, uh, you are very different, but you know, sometimes the, the tendency is to want to blend in and you really don't want to blend in in this process. I mean, you'll see later on that, you know, setting yourself apart in some way, um, that uniqueness is a, an important factor. Um, looking at the next slide, um, Again, it's what I said, you have to stand out. Uh, you know, you, you are looking at people who are reading hundreds, sometimes thousands of applications, depending on the institution. And, you know, every student uh, will have some sort of uh, positive uh, part of their application, one or the other. It's the ones that have balance and that manage to have that one or two things that are going to hook a person. It's it's just like when you get out there and you're you're looking at various things and and something manages to catch your eye, and that's what you're looking to do here, um, and not manufacture it, but actually just present yourself in the best possible way, and then you let the chips lie as they may. So going to the next slide, um, how do you do this? How do you build that competitive profile and uh, so? This is where we talk a little bit about that. And um, before we get into the nuts and bolts, now, these are guidelines. We understand that, <clears throat> excuse me, not every student is gonna be able to do everything that we're suggesting. Um, the idea is to start um, looking at this in a certain way and depending on where you are in your academic career at this point, you know, whether it's ninth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, or even um, later. So. Uh, how do you take the make the best of what opportunities you have? Because that is definitely a factor, and 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 not sacrifice one for the other. So let's get into the um, next slide that will give you some basic uh, ideas of how do you you know earn your spot as business applicant. And these guidelines hopefully will be helpful to you as you move forward. So the next slide talks about the four or five different areas that uh, you know. Uh, admissions officers look for. And this is more true of business and some other disciplines than every other one because, um, and you know, I, I only say this, even though we're talking about a competitive business profile, um, you can uh, sort of change some of the wording and have it apply to other disciplines as well. So some of it will apply across the board. Uh, quantitative 
and analytical skills are very important to business because uh, while you might focus on marketing like I did, um, I also focused on marketing research as a graduate uh, student. Uh, as an undergraduate student, I had an economics degree, but I had a minor in math uh, and computer science um, because that helped me with my business. Uh, and that's largely the reason why I got a fellowship to go to American University. I, I was part of their uh, uh, you know, uh, graduate fellow program. I taught classes. I did research with professors. So if you Google me, you'll see uh, me given credit as a researcher who did statistical analysis for my professors. Um, but I was a marketing student, uh, you know, uh, but I also had a specialization in market research. So quantitative ability is very important. Um, and having a clear direction, uh, you know, and we'll talk more about this, generically applying for business, um, especially now, is a very, very tough, tough way to go. Um, so developing a profile that includes a clear interest, demonstrated business-related activities somehow, whether it's a job, whether it's uh, starting your own company, whether it's getting an internship, whether it's uh, doing something in school with organizations, I think that's really important. Um, and I, and you know, again, uh, this is the leadership is something that you can show in so many different ways, and we'll talk about how to do that later on. But um, you know, a lot of people think leadership is just about, oh, you know, I have to be president of this or I have to be uh, captain of that. It's not necessarily that. It and this is what I um, tell students, and we'll talk more about that um, when we get to that part of the presentation. And. You know, this is this last one is true of everybody in every facet of life, whether it's education, whether it's professional life, uh, you know, your communication skills are extremely important, uh, whether it's in, in an academic situation, whether it's in a professional setting. Um, these are skills that are critical to success for everyone. Uh, so, I mean, that's kind of an obvious one, but we put it out there just to make sure that we reinforce that notion. So getting into the next slide, um, question, I said we would ask questions. So do you think 1450 is uh, the average SAT score for Wharton? Um, and the answer, I'm sure intuitively all of you know the answer, and the answer is um, no, it's not. It's actually higher. And uh, I think, you know, testing is one of those factors that is important. Uh, and, um, you know, but it has its own place. Um, so look at the testing requirements, but uh, always remember um, that this average means there are kids above it and there are kids below it. Um, but then the factor is that how do you, where, wherever you fit, how do you end up being one of those students accepted? And, and that takes a much broader view, which is what we're going to talk about in the next few slides. So. Going to the next slide, um, this gives you an idea of where you, you know you might fall on the SAT or ACT score, um, and this does vary. And and a lot of schools will give you a middle fifty percent. And if you find it hard to understand that, I'd take a moment to just sort of explain that to you. Um, they'll give you a range, so they'll say, okay, it's four. Penn might say our middle fifty percent is. Uh, 1450 to 1540. So what that means is that the 1450, which is the lower number, is the percentile, you know, 25% of the people scored below that number. And the 1540 is the 75th percentile, which means 25% scored above that number. So that is, colleges started reporting middle 50% rather than averages, just to give candidates a better idea of where they fall. So in most cases, you won't see the average SAT score. Um, we do uh, report it to you, but uh, in many cases, you'll see the middle 50%. And that's how you look at that, uh, both for the ACT and the SAT. Um, so it's important to know these numbers. Moving to the next slide. Um, so how do you show this in your application? Obviously, we talked about the SAT and math will obviously be a focus, but don't forget the communication skill part of it. So the English and the verbal does matter. Of course, when you're looking at scores like 1500, 
think about this an 800 on math you still have to get a 700 plus on verbal to uh, get to that number right so um it, i think both sections are important but obviously math is something um you know the sat is it is listed at the top but i would say that being a performer in high school, the, the the way you challenge yourself, whether it's by taking AP courses, especially related to business, um, getting uh, high scores on your APs, um, and and things of that nature in school are really what stand out on the analytical and academic excellence side for you. Of course, um, impressive honors, you know, National Honor Society AP Scholar and. Uh, lots of different awards that your school might give, external awards that you might be able to get. Um, those are all important. There are tons of competitions out there, including uh, math competitions from MIT and Harvard and other places that you can get involved in. Those kinds of things are also uh, helping to reinforce this part of your application. So it's extremely important that your high school performance and your high school course selections reflect um, analytical and quantitative success. Uh, because that is a very important part of what the uh, admissions officers do look for. Um, so going to the next slide, um, just to give you some examples, um, you know, there are courses that even, um, you know, students who are um, taking history and biology, um, they will show academic uh, success on the quantitative side by taking subjects like multivariable calculus, uh, you know, which sometimes, um, you know, this student probably took uh, other AP math before, but then in senior year is taking this. Um, being a national merit semifinalist obviously again reflects a very high uh, score because you have to have um, a good test score on your PSAT to get there. And of course, the rank you can see it's a very high rank uh, so that's how you kind of get to Wharton but have uh, you know have no fear it's not that everybody has this profile but this gives you an idea of the kind of um, things that you're competing against even if you're not if you're there great but even if you're not there there are ways other and we'll talk about those but this is important going to the next slide Again, Calc BC was taken, as I said, they've taken other math courses in the past that were AP stats and calculus and the fives on the test, the math 800. Um, you know, all these things go towards reinforcing even the computer science, uh, I would say, uh, helps with that aspect of it. And then we talked about communication skills. Um, again, we'll talk about those later, but I want to point out here that English language and psychology and history um are in that uh, area as well so we're looking at a balance here which we talked about and the 790 in uh, reading and writing is also helpful moving to the next slide taking a look at um nyu stern and how is that um you don't have a gpa here but look at the high school uh, i mean you don't have the rank but you have to look at the high school weighted gpa um, again, some commended scholar, AP scholar, um, look at the advanced microeconomic, macroeconomics, um, the calculus, um, and the statistics. Not only that, you also have physics in there. So you see a lot of different ways to show that quantitative and analytical aptitude, and NYU Stern obviously appreciated it when they were looking at this uh, candidate. If you go to the next slide, you can see um, again, solid SAT, um, solid um, grades in terms of APs, um, you know, and again, the Calc BC supported by the computer science on the quantitative side with the English language and history on the qualitative side for uh, the communication skills and other things. So demonstrating versatility again. Uh, so these two examples should hopefully give you some idea of how competitive it is, but also kind of reinforce the notion of how to look at the quantitative side of the application. Going to the next slide. 
Now, let's talk about the focus interests within business. And if you we'll go to the next slide, you'll see uh, it starts uh, with lots of different things. But um, again, a question, if you're interested in business, and we, I already gave you the answer earlier, um, your academic interest is enough if you just say business. And I already answered this question. And uh, if you go to the answer, um, you know, business is not good enough in terms of, you know, for the top level um, schools, um, you are, um, you know, you are better served focusing in, in, in a specific area because, um, you know, every college asks uh, in some form the why major question. And when you can answer that why major question in an effective manner and, you know, bring in not only your interests, but your experiences and your academics, and you make it into this nice little package that you can give them, they're much more likely to be hooked into understanding who you are and what you want to do and have a clearer picture of your goals as a business student, uh, rather than just saying, hey, you know, I just want to study business. So I think this is a very important piece. And remember, we kept saying, that uniqueness and versatility we will keep showing up throughout the presentation. And this is one of those areas where it does again. So going to the next slide. Um, so how do you do this? So again, adding, like I talked about Huntsman, uh, and you'll see an example of the Huntsman applicant later, um, adding a secondary area like I did. I was an economics major with undergraduate minors in math, computer science, and of all things, religion. Right, so it broadened my perspective. And when I was in uh, in graduate school, I was marketing and market research, but I also did, um, uh, you know, I I was in operations and computers. Um, so they're all interrelated in some way. And here is an example. You know, you've got business uh, coding. You you know, the environment is very important in the world today. So you can combine that with business. Um, you saw even in the high school selections. Uh, the quantitative with history or, you know, we already talked about Huntsman and international studies. So, you know, you have different ways of uh, combining areas and and showing, again, your uniqueness um, as a candidate by uh, demonstrating your interests in multiple areas and how that the synergy between those areas makes you uh, someone that they, they will come out of there with a special focus. Uh, when you enter professional life or go to grad school. And I think that's important to show um, the people evaluating your application. The next slide um, talks about, you know, again, where was this person applying? Marketing. And again, art is in there. They, they were an artist. They, they talked about the fact that uh, they were interested in chemistry uh, and the pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so again, versatility is used. Um, a lot of different things. You would not necessarily think that a business student uh, would be talking about art and chemistry and, and Chinese fluency. Uh, but, you know, those are the kinds of things that people will say, hey, wait a minute, this is not just a straight business kit. This is somebody who has a diversity of interests and a diversity of skills. And, and, and they're talking about how they will utilize those skills. It's not just about saying, hey, I can do this and I can do this and I can do this. They've actually related it to um, chemistry working in the pharmaceutical industry or creativity uh, or you know, um, a language ability. So they're, they're looking at different things and they're trying to you know, get um, the admissions officer to see their versatility. And I think that's very important. Going to the next slide. Okay, so again, that was sort of a different way to go about it. And this is a, something that says that, okay, if you're not doing the multiple areas, then how do you, you know, just have this laser focus in an area and I'll, uh, I'll give you an example. For example, this year I had a young man applying who's very focused on entrepreneurship. I mean, he in five different ways, um, he demonstrated entrepreneurship and he was an early admit to Babson that is very known for entrepreneurship program. 
So it is very important that you, if you have that, um, then go ahead and showcase it because you can have that hyper-focused approach. And if you have uh, what it takes to back that up, both on all those factors we're talking about, whether it's quantitative, or, but that can still work. But again, um, in each case, it has to be significant, substantial. So again, in this case, there's marketing, there's finance, there's healthcare, entrepreneurship, and there are many other things that you can focus on. Uh, but you can do that as well, as long as it is a substantial part that you can support. And that's the important part of it. Going to the next slide, um, we illustrate that, right? Um, so this is someone who talked about their experience at Penn, uh, where they talked about entrepreneurship, financial concepts, and moving that towards a global perspective. And that's certainly important. Um, so again, you can focus in a particular area, but then you have to back it up with everything that, that comes with it. So uh, the next slide, um, okay, we'll go now to, again, it's related to what we were just talking about. How do you show um, excellence in business-related activities, which goes into either the hyper-focus or the other? So again, intuitively, um, when you ask yourself this question, uh, do you need this on your resume? Uh, what, is, what do you think the answer is? Um, I guess Jillian's going to show us in a minute. Um, so go ahead and let's see the answer. Okay. So again, it's what we're just trying to reinforce the notions that we've just talked about. Mature. Mature means that this is not something you just say, that you support it. Proven. Again, show it. Um, say it but show it. And I think that's really important because the word coveted spots, um, you know, one would think that uh, there's so many applications, right? In so many schools and so many places, but it's the coveted spots that are in question here. And you saw the numbers when we looked at the business school acceptance rates. Um, so those are truly coveted spots. And the way to get there is by showing these substantiated, substantial um, interests that are diverse. So I think this is an important thing and we just keep reinforcing that. I know I sound like a broken record at times, but um, it is important. Okay, going to the next slide. Um, again, the words mature and proven should answer this question for you uh, that, you know, is it just enough to list it on there? And the answer is no. It's a level of involvement and leadership. And again, We'll talk about leadership a little more, but yes, it's definitely important to have activities and, and, and other things related to business. And, and yes, clubs and organizations are important. It's the question is, what do you do with those opportunities? You know, did you make the most of the opportunity that you had to make an impact? And even if you weren't the president of the club, what did you do to show that impact? And how can you showcase it in an application? And we'll talk, we'll show that to you in a little bit of how students have done that. You've seen a couple of examples of it before with the NYU uh, CERN and the Wharton application, and we'll continue to show you how to do this. Uh, but this is important. And this is true, by the way, of um, any discipline that you're applying for business, certainly more so because of the, the high level of competitiveness, but, uh, competitiveness, but now this is important all the way through. Um, so go to the next slide and we'll see um so how how do you see you know as i said that mature the proven um and what is excellent so it's significant impact how is that sustained involvement through high school you didn't just join it in uh 10th grade uh but you uh joined it um you know in ninth grade and continued to grow in your level of responsibility and involvement um that you're able to show what you did uh, realistically, um, demonstrating um, your impact. And then, of course, we all love winners, don't we? Um, so whatever you were able to demonstrate in terms of uh, competitiveness, in terms of achievement, is important. Um, and then again, a common thread that you've heard throughout the presentation 
uh, of leadership. We all admire leaders. We all look up to them, whether it's in the business world, whether it's in the sports world or otherwise science, wherever. Uh, so leadership um, uh, can take many varieties and we'll talk about that in the future. So this is, you know, it's very important because this is true for, this can be applied to any discipline, but it's very true of business because of the level of competitiveness and the versatility of factors that you have to present when you are trying to be a competitive candidate in this really, really competitive environment. So going to the next slide. Um, yeah, so the question we get a lot is that, you know, what counts? And you know, there really is no limit to what counts. So it's clubs, organizations, internships, summer programs. There's some amazing summer programs out of the, out there. Competitions, you know, Wharton has a global investment competition. I already mentioned math competitions. There are competitions of every sort. All you have to do is go and do research. And the great thing, you know, um, the awful years that we spent, thanks to COVID, um, you know, it's hard to say that that catastrophe has any sort of silver lining. But the one thing that, you know, came out of that is the increased number of online things that you can do um, and, and, and how organizations are supporting not just summer programs and internships and volunteer opportunities and competitions. Um, there are opportunities, you know, so the, pande but the pandemic was devastating to the world, but the one thing it taught us as human beings is that you know we have to find solutions and one of the solutions was the online just like we're doing the webinar today um you know there are competitions that you can undertake there are summer programs you know every top level school is offering online courses to students so it doesn't matter if you're you know if you're located in um uh, australia and want to take a course at mit uh, chances are you can, even if you can't travel to MIT. Um, if you want to participate in the Wharton competition and you're a kid studying in my school in Pakistan, you can do that. Um, you know, there are uh, volunteer opportunities and internship opportunities. You know, you can go to Zooniverse and find different um, areas to volunteer in. Uh, you know, I had a kid um, doing squirrel mapping where people would send him pictures of squirrels from all over the world and he would map them and it helped with squirrel conservation and it was an online volunteering opportunity. So there are tons of things. And then again, as I mentioned, that one student that I had who was interested in entrepreneurship, you know, he created a school related entrepreneurship uh, opportunity. Um, he created his own organization. So there were, he did both these things, you know, he participated in an entrepreneurial un endeavor, but he also created his own project. Um, so uh, those are all ways you can show um, that, you know, you are excellent on the non academic side in many different ways. So going to the next slide. Um, what are the traditional business related activities? We all know them, right? Uh, it's DECA or FBLA, other, you know, the finance club, economics club, um, some sort of leadership, whether it's student council, government, um, you know, and getting a position within a club, um, you know, lots of different ways to, you know, get involved with business related activities inside school. Um, and then going to the next slide, um, talk about different things again fbla and deca we talked about but then there's also other organizations girl state boy state there are, there are tons of them out there and they're not just the i mean this is just a sampling you just have to get online and start looking look in your own areas um you know communities have uh, started developing programs uh, because again young people bring creativity and 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 you know and and most of all in many cases uh, they don't charge right uh, if, if you're looking at an older person they're coming in and they want to be compensated for the young person the compensation is the experience and and they they can contribute their skills so um 
it, it takes creativity on your part to go out and find these opportunities. But I promise you, in most communities, they're there. So volunteering at a museum, volunteering at a corporation, you know, talking to your parents, maybe one of their friends has a business you can get involved with. Um, you can start your own organization. There are chapters, you know, the scouts, uh, there are tons of them, um, you know, so don't limit yourself. Think, think broadly, think beyond the norm. Uh, certainly the norm of FBLA and DECA, those are impressive, but um, others can be as impressive too. So moving to the next slide. Again, I talked about the personal networking to find opportunities. Um, experience, you know, it's really very important. And this is an analogy I use a lot with my students. And I say, you know, um, when you're doing an internship or, or something and um, you know, you can talk about it, about what you learned and how you contributed rather than, oh, you know, I just made copies and brought coffee to my boss, right? Um, it's that experience that you can say. And so if it's not working at a, a major company and you still contribute, think about it. This, the, the major companies may not be able to give you the kind of experiences that smaller companies do. I had a young lady from Brazil who started out as an intern for a marketing company where she was just, you know, the uh, one of her mom's friends just offered this opportunity to come and, um, you know, just see what was going on in the organization. But when she got there, uh, they realized she had some real skills and could, could really contribute to the marketing effort. So even when the internship was over, they were like, no, no, you have to stay involved with the business. And, you know, OK, we understand you're in school, but we want you to do this and we want you to do that. And again, you know, because of that experience, she was an and she was an ED to Babson. Um, her brother went to Babson too, so obviously she wanted that place. But you know, but you know, she wasn't necessarily uh, uh, you know on the academic or other sides uh, that great a fit for Babson. But that particular experience. I think personally really put her over the top because she could talk about the fact that she started out as somebody, you know, who was just there to learn. And then she became a contributing member, which is focus on the output, the longer spread out. I mean, she, she hit all these notes. It wasn't just, you know, she used a personal network. Um, you know, she applied in an area of her interest. Um, you know, it was a small company. Nobody ever heard of it. Um, but then, you know, she was contributing. And, and she was there for a longer period of time because they valued what she did. Um, so this is important. This can put you over the top. Uh, and for her, it certainly did. You know, so uh, this is a serious, these are serious things. And I can give you tons of examples of them. And so uh, we won't go there, but, uh, you know, they do exist. Um, so let's go to the next slide. Um, again, we talked about these programs, right? Um, I talked about the Wharton Investment Program, but LBW, you know, I have a young man right now who went to LBW. He is, he is the one uh, that is now looking at Penn as his top choice. Um, and there are tons of them. Um, Stern has programs, Berkeley has programs, virtually everybody has something or the other you can get involved in uh, the summer. And and the, the sheer diversity of what's out there you know, even niche interests like sports. You know, I have a young man who's interested in sports management. I have another young man who's uh, in Korea and he's a drummer and he wants to uh, do something with music and business. And, and you know, it, it was a surprise for him when we gave him eight different options of summer programs he could do with that interest. You know, he didn't even think there would be one, um, you know, so... Um, Research is very important. Um, research the programs and then whatever is practical for you to do, um, do it. Because again, not only will it show well on your resume, the experience in itself that you, when you talk about it in your essays, when you list it on your activity list, um, that will make a difference. And that will make the admissions officer take note. Why? Because you had this interest and you pursued it beyond what was available to you in your local community. And that's important. You know, when you stretch yourself, when you do research, when you push yourself to do more than what you could just do by simply going along with the flow of things, um, you know, I, I, the word disruptor, you know, you disrupt the norm. Um, that's what gets noticed, right? 
Going to the next slide. Again, just go and look at out there. There are so many competitions. Um, it, it just boggles the mind. And these are recognized. They are uh, respected competitions. Um, and they, de again, demonstrate your ability to compete and uh, you know, across an international forum. Uh, it shows team uh, ability to function as a team to, um, you know, to pursue different areas of interest. Um, I think it's really important. Um, and again, not every student will get to these international competitions. There are local competitions, there are, you know, quiz bowls and, and tons of these other competitions, economics competitions that you can get involved in. So don't limit yourself, uh, but it is important that you know that this is out there and go after whatever you think matches your interests and how it can help you uh, stand out from the crowd. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here's an example, right? Vice President Lawn Checks, right? At a very good high school, highly respected high school, but notice, the years of involvement are under the academic, it's 10, 11, 12. So this young person didn't just show up in 11th grade or 12th grade for this. Um, they did this and probably started out as being a member and then rose to the level of vice president, right? Uh, participated in the Diamond Challenge, which is an international competition. And again, supervised logistics, right? coordinated with 20 countries, um, economics challenge, co-captain. So um, smart tech award for uh, you know, uh, the Conrad challenge, a diversity of competitions, right? Um, is it, again, just absorb this, um, you know, mentored five teams involved in 20 countries, shows the depth of involvement not just, okay, vice president, but what did you do? What did you accomplish? You know, quantitative demonstration of leadership. Yes, in this case, it was easy because vice president, co-captain, chair, easy. But even if you took those away and put in descriptions that offered substantial achievement, that would be great. So this is an example of a award and admit. And if you go to the next slide. Again. We talked about this, right? Uh, start a club, start a nonprofit organization. I have a young person who created a product because he was very interested in working with the hearing impaired. Uh, so he developed some sort of vest to help them when they're uh, in traffic and things like that. Uh, starting your own blog or portfolio. I have a young lady who's very interested in photography. So she started her own uh you know uh social media account and and uh, and has a portfolio online uh so those are all things that uh you know you can do um of course starting a business or a company you know it can be a small business it doesn't have to be a huge uh one uh but it shows initiative it shows uh going after something you want identifying a gap in the school club, uh, you know, or reviving a school club. I had a young person who took a computer science club that was largely dormant and reactivated it. And, and yeah, they, you know, in the first year, they didn't accomplish so much. But then later on, they developed it into more things. And they could talk about that. They could talk about the revival and, and, and how they went from a club with uh, six or eight people that were just not doing anything and just meeting for the sake of it to a vibrant community of 20 people that were doing things. And um, it's important for that, you know. Um, and so you can do a lot of different things to demonstrate your entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and that is, again, an important part of how you can set yourself apart. Um, going to the next slide. So this is an example, right? Um, founded Teens for Refugees, right? Um, Co-hosted Yale Refugee Project webinars, published articles. So it wasn't just they founded this, they demonstrate through this, raised money, hosted webinars, did a paper and articles, very important. Similarly, again, look at the 9, 10, 11, 12, the, the length, 
the maturity, how many hours a week? It was three hours a week, 45 weeks a year. Three hours a week for 45 years shows sustain. You know, it wasn't just like, okay, you know, I did it for a few days and then I let it go. Same thing with the second one, founder and CEO of Team Teaches, right? Um, again, depth of involvement, significant outcome, demonstrable success. Uh, these are all things that help you set apart. Of course, this, this young person would have gotten noticed in the process, and this is important for you. Uh, we illustrate this as examples. Again, keep in mind, not everybody may get two things like this or even one thing like this, but if you can, it's the spirit of what we're trying to convey to you uh, the, to set yourself apart. That's very important. And to the extent you can get involved with things like this, absolutely, it will help you set yourself apart. Going to the next slide. Um, one of the things that are, uh, you know, uh, Jillian illustrated some of our professors in the slides, you know, where we had my picture, then we had the graduate coaches who worked with the students in their applications. Um, so the admissions officer role is like mine, you know, it's an advisor, it's somebody who guides you strategically through the process. The graduate coaches worked work with you to advise you on a lot of the nuts and bolts of the application process. And the third slide you saw were the people who were professors at various universities. And we have some incredible programs that allow, they call academic mentoring programs that are either individual or group projects that allow young people to work with these university professors. And to be honest, the courses that are offered, sometimes I've actually thought about whether, I mean, I'm, I'm well past my years where I should study, but, you know, there was one course that was listed as from Zeus to Iron Man, and it was about, um, you know, mythology and the world of today and social, uh, you know, lots of different things and working with the professor. And imagine the opportunity to work with a professor and you can do this uh, through Ingenious or otherwise as well, but Ingenious has these developed programs that, you know, a lot of my students have done and, and it really does help set them apart because uh, they can, in many cases, even publish that research. Um, so those are very important parts of how you can show your, uh, you know, uniqueness, uh, taking online classes, business, economics, certainly, but again, quantitative ability is important, uh, technology is important, um, you know, it can be uh, ingenious as an incredibly popular uh, writing and leadership program. Um, and I'm sure there are others as well, but obviously I know Ingenious and I know what it has done, uh, you know, for the students I have counseled. And, and so I encourage you to look at these opportunities because, uh, you know, if you can find uh, people to guide you um, uh, with your research and, and if you can get published. Um, and yeah, you know, obviously not everybody can, but those are things, again, that just help you stand out. And that's why we mentioned them, because they are opportunities um, that you can pursue. Going to the next slide. Um, again, uh, Professor Stern, uh, Professor Gelser working uh, with students, you know, again, online music service, right? Business plan for an online music service. And again, traditional pieces of what a business plan does. Um, again, this is a focused project, three weeks, uh, six weeks, three hours a week in grade 10. And so this showed that in grade 10, at a very young age, this person was able to work with a university level professor and develop something that will definitely, along with the other things they have on their resume, uh, you know, show their uniqueness. Not every student uh, will have this opportunity to work with an NYU professor while they are in high school. And that, again, will be noticed. There's no question about that. Uh, so please look at these things uh, very seriously as opportunities. Going to the next slide. Okay. We've been talking about leadership, so now let's really talk about leadership. Um, let's look at the next slide. Um, Again, I think I gave you the answer to this earlier on. So you can you be a leader without being the president? And the answer is rather obvious. Um, you know, the impact that you have, you know, is really, really important. And you saw that 
um, every, in every case, the successful candidates, not, not just the title, but what they did, how they did it, how broad was the impact. It was 20 countries. It was mentoring five teams. It was working with multiple people. It was actually what they accomplished. And it's what I said about the kid from Brazil, right? It wasn't a big organization. She didn't have a fancy title, but it's what she did that appealed to the admissions committee, which got her in. So you can be a leader without the title. Obviously the title helps, but the title without the impact probably wouldn't stand out as much. So um, just remember the impact is the critical thing. The title helps, but the impact is what's really the, the most important thing here. Going to the next slide. So here's sort of the, the what we talked about, right? Um, how you have affected your community. That is the important thing. Uh, tangible achievements, right? We talked about it. Number of people that you were um, a leader for. How did you help grow the organization? Like I said, took a dormant computer science club of five people and made it 30 people, right? It's not going to 3,000 people, but that five to 30 is six times what it started with, right? So that shows growth. Money raised, right? Even $1,200 or $12,000, the question is you were able to do something and then what did you do with that money? Demonstrate that, right? Events held, did you do a fundraiser? Did you hold a competition? Did you give opportunities for your peers to get involved with things? shows a broader impact. You know, it's not just me. I'm not showing what I did for myself. It's what I did for others around me. Um, very important. Um, there's an element of community service in addition to the leadership that you can demonstrate through things like this. Uh, so it's very important to show your impact as a leader. And again, you don't have to be the president. You can still be somebody in the organization helping um, and creating. And, 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 you know, even if you just... Um, can show that impact through tangible achievements. That's really important. Um, on to the next slide then. Um, so where, where do you start and where do you end, right? So you start with your classroom, your club, uh, then you move to your school, um, your community, and then of course the state and country. And, you know, it's interesting. So one young person I've worked with just started something small in his school. Um, and then, you know, somebody in the community noticed and wanted to do it at other schools. And so this kid went and made presentations at multiple schools in his community and they adopted the program. Um, and then he went online and he started offering these things. Um, and now has a broader perspective and in fact, might even be looking at internationally. Now, again, it's very early, it's very, you know, uh, it's small steps. Well, imagine being able to talk about that. Imagine being able to talk about something that you started in your own little back backyard that has now blossomed to something that potentially, even if it's one person looking at it internationally, that's something. And I think that's really, you know, that scope of impact um, to be able to demonstrate that. And this graphic, I think, illustrates it really well, is that you start out with you and just keep growing it and keep growing it. And who won't take notice of that? I mean, and, and, I mean, we're human beings. We, we get impressed by these things. And admissions officers, you know, um, I know we don't, you don't see them and you see this as some sort of process. It's a very human process in most cases, especially at the highly competitive schools. And these kinds of things do stand out because they do have an impact. Um, so your impact, uh, excuse the cliche, your impact does have an impact on the other side as well. So that is important for you to know. Going on to the next slide. So we've been talking about leadership, right? And, and why it's so prevalent in, in this conversation. Look at the people that we, we look up to in the world today, whether it's on an international scale, a national scale, or even within your own community or your household, right? Um, performance, success, um, executing plans and a vision. Um, you know, you start out with a vision, 
in a in a of creating a different kind of commute computer in a in your parents' garage and it now blossoms into everybody wants an iPhone, right? Where did we start and where did we end? Um, it was executing the vision, right? Uh, setting the culture of an organization. Um, half the company doesn't work on at the office anymore. They they work remotely and and look at us. We're having a webinar that's online and and our organization works largely remotely. Um, uh, you know, so uh, where did that come from? You know, and and setting the tone and culture. Um, you know, like we have or like any organization. Um, you know, and and growth and innovation. I mean, we talked about that in terms of the whole explosion of online abilities for us as human beings to interact, uh, whether it's professionally, personally, um, you know, um, you can you can talk to your friends in ways that I couldn't when I was in college. Um, and so those are things um, that are really important, uh, but it's the last one, you know, motivating people towards a common goal i mean you know the imp again this is about impact all those other ones are extremely important but you can really make a difference in the lives of others and i think in the world of today that is really important it's making a difference in the lives of others and i think um, every educator every parent every mentor tries to inculcate that in young people because that's what the future is all about, isn't it? Um, and so um, it, the tagline is, if you want to be successful in business, you need to be a strong leader starting in high school. And that's absolutely true. But I think if you substituted business and, and put the word life in there, I think you wouldn't be far wrong. Uh, so think about the impact of this set of things, especially the last one, um, you know, these are extremely high level thoughts, but they are important thoughts. And, and, and again, relating them to the college application process, um, when you can demonstrate these kinds of things, they will make people take notice and, and they will set you apart. And, and leadership is an, a very important and prominent area that can do this for you. So let's go to the next slide. So again, the obvious one, right? Get voted to the top, get a title, but then lots of different things. I talked about increasing participation, increasing per, uh, you know performance, um, winning something, uh, leading projects, getting involved with others. Again, we just talked about fostering the growth of others, right? Helping others. Um, so I think all these, and we've talked about them throughout the presentation, uh, this is sort of summarizing what we've been doing throughout. Um, you've seen it in the in the examples of the admits to various places like Wharton and Stern and and so on. And and those are examples given to reinforce this notion that tangible achievements, being able to demonstrate these things, are very important um, in terms of leadership, in terms of achievement. And so we just want to reinforce that. Going to the next slide, um, again, founder, CEO, three weeks, three hours a week, 45 weeks a year, 15 plus schools, 40 plus tutors, right? You saw this before, road educational blogs. So again, just the numbers, the magnitude of impact, the level of commitment, all those things are important and again, Wharton saw it as valuable. I'm sure they saw many other things about this young person as valuable to the community, but this certainly probably helped a significant amount. Okay, so going to the next slide. Communication skills, both written and verbal. So let's talk a little more about them, how we show that in the next slide. Um, What do you think the answer to this is? Uh, to be a successful business leader, I think intuitively the answer becomes absolutely, right? If Jillian will, you are, you are going to be a communicator at the highest level if you're going to be successful. Why? 
because in order to communicate the vision, in order to ensure that your, commu your community, whether it's the business community, whether it's the world around you, is moving in a positive direction, comes from you being able to articulate accurately, whether it's written, whether it's verbal, and in some cases, visual um, these days, um, you know, all those things are very important. And and so this is a very obvious thing, I think. But I think we, we again, this is more about reinforcement of concepts as well as providing new information. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so again, accurately delivering your vision, sharing your goals and inspiring others, motivating others. Um, you know, showing, you know, one of the most important things I do as a leader is listen. And you know what, when you listen to others, it not only gives them confidence in you, it gives them confidence in themselves. And, you know, my success is certainly important, but my success as, as a leader is built on the successes of all those people that work around me. Um, and when I give them the confidence to make decisions and and to uh, to do things, then we as a team succeed. And I think that's what communication and leadership um, can work together to do. Um, and we talked about that earlier, right? The impact you can have on others. And I think that's really important. Um, it leads to success. It leads to financial success. It leads to respect. It leads to reputation. Uh, there are tons of things that come as a consequence of all of these. Um, you know, there's a real synergy between leadership and communication and, uh, and, and success. And I think that is what we're trying to say, um, that if you can show this potential in your college application, because you're very young and you're going to grow and you're going to build these, these skills in the future, but an admissions officer reviewing your application needs to see the seeds um, and see, needs to see the potential of leadership and communication skills to see, be able to see the future and say, OK, yeah, you know what? I can see what the next step is for this young person. So going to the next slide, um, how do they assess this? What, are the, you know, what shows them that you can do this? Um, in your essays, when you talk about leadership, your teamwork and activities, what you accomplished, why you did it, right? Uh, being able to write a compelling essay, and this is what I tell my students, pursue something you love and you have a passion for. When your passion comes through in an essay, there's nothing like it to hook an admissions officer. Um, you know, and, and this is really important. Um, and, and so your essays are very valuable in, in giving people who are reading tons of these essays a window into your life and, and being able to, uh, you know, say to them, uh, yeah, you know what, this is a person we want. And I'll tell you, um, Dean Charles Deacon of Georgetown University used to walk into my office and sometimes with a file and say, Raheel, uh, this kid, and and I'd say, yeah, you know, did you read this or did you read that? And he'd just shake his head, and you know, because I just I I have fallen in love with this application for some reason that you know maybe others may not have, but it it resonated with me, and and so Charlie would just say, you know, he just shake his head at me sometimes, uh, but you know that's what happens. As I said, it's a human process, and when you write an exceptional essay or you know you move somebody. That can make a difference. Certainly, your grades and academics. You know, I think that's a basic thing that we we say that, and I think every student knows that that's the basic building block of a college application. That um, you want to be successful on the academic side, and then um, you know that's what leads to letters of recommendation that are strong because you've demonstrated that in class and your teachers know you both as students and as people and can write about those things. And that's certainly important. Um, and, you know, interviews are very important. You know, Georgetown does alumni interviews as do, you know, I interview for Reed um, as an inter alumni interviewer. And interviews can make a difference because, you know, Sometimes uh, we don't see as much of you in your essays and your application um, as we do when we meet you. And sometimes that can help um, 
provide a perspective that may not otherwise be available to an admissions committee. And so a lot of times when I was chairing a committee, the, the rest of the committee would say, you know, when they were conflicted about a candidate, uh, you know, and they were looking at five people and we had two spots left, um, they'd go to the alumni interview and, uh, and Georgetown's alumni uh, were very passionate about this. And and they you know they'd write these uh, wonderful reports about young people they had met, and that sometimes can make the difference. Um, so all these factors, both on the written side, you know, don't minimize the impact of being um, you know uh, strong in your essays and 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 demonstrating your verbal ability as well as your written ability because they are looking for these things because you know when you get to college those are definitely things that uh, identify with successful graduates of any institution so it's important uh, that these factors are present in your application and, um, portfolio when you send it so let's move to the next slide um so how do you you know how do you improve these things and how do you demonstrate well, debate, certainly, you know, I've, I have, uh, I am currently fortunate enough to be working with a young lady from Canada who uh, just got to ninth grade this year, but since seventh and eighth grade, she's been participating in international competitions such as Harvard and Yale and uh, other, and incredibly, you know, well-spoken and, you know, the communication skills are just off the charts because of debate. Um, and, you know, other things can do it as well, you know, uh, competitions where you have to pitch for um, entrepreneurship uh, for presentations, um, you know, Model UN, again, like debate, you have to fight for your position, your uh, point of view, and that can not only uh, encourage communication skills, but encourage confidence, encourage the ability to uh, sub um, you know, support your arguments, whether it's in writing or uh, verbally, that's important. Um, student government, by definition, you know, we said leaders have to have good communication skills, so that sort of puts you in there. Um, and there are many other ways. I mean, we could go on for, you could list probably another 10 things on here and, and still not have enough, but, um, you know, look for opportunities uh, to show your verbal and written communication skills. And that can also be an important factor in the admissions process, especially for uh, business programs. Uh, going to the next slide, um, just showing, you know, an example of, you know, somebody who earned honors in uh, debate tournaments, um, semifinalists in the classic speech tournament, right? Uh, uh, Toastmaster Club founder, captain of the speech team, and then co-founded uh, you speak. Okay, again, look at the magnitude, taught 100 plus kids, first generation immigrant families, managed finances, right? Uh, tripled membership, magnitude. Uh, third NCFL Grand Nationals qualifier, right? Led the team to second place. So all these tangible achievements clearly demonstrated, uh, very important. And again, communication skills being shown, um, uh, valued by Wharton. So important things. Just let's go to the next slide. All right, so taking a look at uh, some applications and case studies, so let's take a look at some of these. Let's uh, move to the next slide. And um, it's, when you apply it using the Common App or even other applications, um, make sure that you pay careful attention to what's being asked. And this is, you know, we've talked about some of these things. You, you must be able to articulate your future plans, um, not just, again, um, you know, in a particular generic sense of business, but in a specific area, maybe combining different areas, um, you know, so something related to business must be a, a part of your future plans. It gives your vision for not only what you're going to study in college, but what you're going to do beyond. And it shows them how you think about business and your involvement in it. Uh, certainly, we've talked about listing business in your extra extracurricular or academic um, areas. But again, substantial demonstration of these things is very important. And the intended major 
within the business or economics category, uh, maybe combined with something else as a minor. These are all, um, again, important things that you have to make sure are part of your application, whether it's a common app or otherwise. Um, it's critically important that you are very clear about your interests in business and where uh, it's going to take you in the future. So going to the next slide. Um, it is, you know, a lot of times uh, when we look at things, you read the first thing and then you read the second thing and you read the third thing. And, you know, the first thing tends to have the greatest amount of impact on you. So when you prioritize things and you showcase things, um, not to say that the 10th activity won't carry impact if it's substantial and in, in, a, in a highly competitive admissions process, um, everything is going to count. But it's important that you prioritize your accomplishments. And we've talked about focusing on impact, leadership ability, using action word. You know, I mean, this goes to communication skills, the, the ability to use the verbs and, and provide quantifiable achievements are the ones that are going to say uh, how meaningful the things that you're talking about are. And that's really uh, important. Um, uploading a resume. Uh, you know, a lot of students are not able to share everything they've done on the common application or a college application. And, and, and also the resume gives you a way to show, um, you know, because again, being a business person, you should be able to put together a resume and demonstrate that. Um, and so pay attention to that. And the great thing is online, you have tons of templates and resources available to you um, that you can research and, and find models for you uh, to um, you know, emulate. So you can design your CV, uh, your uh, resume and make it interesting, uh, creative um, and always substantial. Uh, you know, that's the important thing and highlight those things that may not have been highlighted in the scarce space that you had in your application, because sadly, there are word limits and character limits in a lot of places. And so you are constrained by that. But in your resume, you don't have that constraint. I'd certainly try to keep it to one page unless it was substantial enough to go beyond that. Um, but also don't crowd everything into one page and make it unreadable. Uh, so that's my sort of guideline on the resume because that, you know, I'd rather you take it, you know, further than one page rather than try to expand your margins and have it look like, you know, in a very small font. So try to make it, that's why the word professional resume, um, professional does refer to the content, but it also refers to the appearance in my book. All right. So these are all very important things to communicate your accomplishments and how you prioritize them to the admissions committees. Going to the next slide. All right. Now, this is the way you share your voice with an admissions team. Uh, and you can demonstrate things through a personal statement that don't come through anywhere else. Same thing with the essays. So all these factors, we've talked about them, character and maturity, demonstrating that through your essays, your leadership style, um, you know, of course, what your interest is, not just in academic uh, areas, but also professionally what you want to do later in life. Um, obviously, we said communication skills, we've showed you how that is. Um, you know, your goals, you know, this is something that, it's kind of showing up all the way through, but I want to take a minute to talk about this. You know, it's important to show that you have a future plan. It's important to show that you believe in that plan and how do you want to go after it? A lot of the essays, and, and you know, this is the interesting thing that colleges help you with this. They ask you, you know, what makes you unique and how will you contribute to this community? They give you that prompt. And sometimes students miss that. You know, they write about it and I say, wait a minute, you haven't answered the question. So the one guideline that I have for you, in addition to all these six things that are listed here, is read the essay very carefully. And I'll give you a real example of a young man this year who was extremely conflicted about an essay. If you look at the University of Chicago, they have this essay um, that talks about a palindrome, something that reads the same uh, forwards and backwards. And generally it refers to a word, 
right? So if you use the word seize, S-E-E-S, -E -E it reads the same both ways, right? So he was thinking about using that prompt for his essay, but he wanted to do something different. So he actually chose a book that, you know, uh, was written front and back, but he said, you know, is it really a palindrome or heel? And I said, yeah, you know what? This demonstrates thinking outside the box. It, it's something they'll never have seen before, and it'll be treated, you know, uh, listed as a literary palindrome as opposed to a literal palindrome. And he was very conflicted about it, and he um, he really thought about not writing that essay, but he wrote it, and he did such a great job. And I kept saying, "Hey, man, this is going to work. This is going to work." And and I'm happy to say that he got into Chicago, and I was able to say, "Hey, you know what? I told you so." So, you know, paying attention to the prompt and then using your creativity and your ability to answer that, um, you know, make sure, did you answer all the things that they asked you to? Did you look at the intent, um, not just the words, but what they were trying to ask? That is what's really important. And in there, show all these things. That's really the important part, okay? Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so let's look at a case study. I can go ahead and um, explain this case study now. Um, we can go it's over- It's all you, A. Jillian, it's all you now. Awesome. Um, so student A was a previous student of ours. Um, she attended a public school in New Jersey and she had a really strong test scores. She had a good GPA. She had a 5.3 out of 6.0. Um, she had a 20, 30, 90 out of 2400 SAT. And she had on the SAT too, she had math two, um, she had an 800 and Spanish 680. So she had great scores. Um, and she had this persona that we developed with her um, that she she is a refugee and human rights advocate who is passionate about international relations. And now we're kind of going to dive into that persona and how we helped develop that in her applications. Um, so you can see that when she got started with us, she had quite a few extracurriculars under her belt already. Um, she had founded a refugee nonprofit. Um, she was a soccer player. She was Bollywood dancer. And we added more things to this list, as you can tell here, um, when we worked with her as well. And we're kind of going to chat about that and the process. Um, so when student A got started with us, student A's GPA was lower than the average of students. Um, admitted to Penn from her high school historically. Student A was very passionate about international relations, but didn't have unique extracurricular academic, academic activities or extracurricular activities to support this interest. Um, student A wanted to apply to the Huntsman program at the University of Pennsylvania, a dual degree program. I, be, I believe Raheel actually mentioned this program earlier on call today, um, but it's a dual degree program in international studies and business at Wharton, and it's very competitive, um, but student A was very set on this program. So now we're going to kind of talk about what we did with her. Um, student A had already started her teens for refugees nonprofit, like I mentioned before, um, but she had not accomplished much with this nonprofit. Um, and as Raheel mentioned earlier, it's really about the impact you make. Um, so we coached her to make an impact. We coached her to start a website for her organization, um, teensforrefugees.com. We helped her host a clothing drive to raise money for her organization. Um, we helped her open chapters in other cities and countries. And now she could list tangible achievements on her activities list. Um, she founded nonprofit for refugees, built the website, hosted blood and clothing drive, held webinar with Yale Refugee Project, opened chapters in New Jersey and India. Um, and as we talked about earlier too, she really expanded this organization from something kind of that she created in her backyard to something that was on a global level. Um, so a really great story about kind of how we helped her expand that interest. Um, then we also wanted to help student A with more codifying of her extracurricular activities. Um, we wanted student A to publish uh, to publish work about her achievements. Um, we actually helped student A get selected to publish an article about educational opportunities for refugees. Um, and she later listed this in the section of her common app. So you can see that she was selected to publish the article about education opportunities for refugees and teen voices and crestios. So that's super great um, achievement that she was able to list as an honor on her common app. 
Um, and then we helped her with summer planning as well. So we helped her um, with getting into an international relations um, program. Student A applied for and was accepted into that program. Um, student A also did a summer course at a university, as we talked about earlier. Um, she attended a summer course in international relations at Columbia, um, the ethics of political violence. And then she also got fantastic work experience um, at an immigration law firm. And all of these interests, as you can kind of tell, all of these things that she's pursuing um, outside of the classroom are really related to that core interest that she has in international relations. Um, so we've really helped her kind of develop this persona that I chatted about earlier that I kind of introduced to you all. Um, through her experiences, through her summer programs, um, through that publication, um, through that nonprofit she organized and um, achieved all of those wonderful things through. So that's a little bit about kind of how we helped her. And now basically as a summary here, um, before she got started with our services um, and she got started with the candidacy building package where essentially we help students build up their candidacy. Um, she was the founder of a nonprofit um, she had no summer programs, she had no courses at universities, no work experience, and after working with us, we helped her build a website, host a blood drive, open new chapters, get published, attended a girls' state camp, um, took summer courses at Columbia, interned at a law firm focusing on immigration. Um, so then we kind of had to shift gears and focus on application season. Um, so we had to help her um, write an additional essay about her current international issue um, to apply for this program, for the Huntsman program. Um, she had a lot of material to choose from, but we encouraged her to write about the Syrian refugee crisis because this topic really allowed her to show her passion for refugee advocacy. It allowed her to highlight the related work that she had done to that topic. Um, and it also allowed her to discuss her career goals in international relations. Um, so we kind of helped her translate this into her applications um, and we helped her show her program fit through this topic. We helped student a student A address both her interests in international studies and business. Um, and to be successful, she really addressed both aspects of the program's curriculum in her um, essays on her application and you know focus it also um at the syrian refugee crisis and kind of consisting um kind of drawing back on that theme so this is um the result she was accepted to the huntsman program at upenn um which was fantastic um and just, you know it's a very competitive program so we were so excited um, that she got accepted after all the work we've done with student a um, but yeah, you can, you can learn about a little bit about our programs here. You can always shoot us an email. You can see Kristen's email down at the bottom of the screen. If you're interested in learning more about kind of our services and how we work with students in services like how we help student A, um, we do have a candidacy building package, which is more geared towards students that are looking to help um, build up their candidacy. Like um, we kind of talked about today and getting involved in activities that are really well tailored to your interests um, or to your passions and future goals. Um, we also help students with our academic mentorship program where he'll also kind of touched base on this program earlier too, um, how we work with a lot of professors from top universities in the US and we help students do research with them um, and even get published. We also have writing classes that help students improve their English reading and writing skills with an Ivy League teaching fellow or writing instructor. Um, we have the guaranteed internship program as well. Um, we you know help interns um, find internships with top um, top 100 companies and fast growing startups to gain work experience. Um, and then we also have an application counseling package too. And this is really geared towards students that are going through the process of building and beginning their applications. Um, and so, yeah, depending on where you're at in, in high school and what kind of service you're looking for, we're definitely happy to help. We're very passionate about helping students through this admissions process um, and through this competitive landscape. Um, but if you have any questions or concerns, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're definitely happy to help and chat with you about how we can help you. Okay, so we can go ahead and um, switch gears and focus now on um, some questions and Q&A. Um, just to take a quick moment here, um, if you could fill out this poll, that would be great. Um, it just asks if you're interested in a free consultation to learn more about our packages and services. Um, no, you know, no pressure, but when you get the chance, if you could do that. And now we'll go ahead and get started with the Q&A. Um, so we can go through some of the questions that you guys have been asking throughout the presentation. And if you do have any additional questions, feel free to put them in the Q&A box. 
or in the chat box as well. Okay, awesome. We'll go through these questions. Okay, so in the chat box, we have um, four public schools. Is there any way to tell the out of state acceptance rates? Okay, so um, this answer is going to cover a lot of different uh, questions that have been asked. Okay. Um, a very scary document is available on every university because they are required to submit it um, and it is publicly available. It's called the common data set. The common data set is something you can Google and you can download for every institution. It takes a little going through because it's pages and pages of voluminous data, uh, but you can get specific data on a lot of different things because there were a lot of questions. Well, how do you know this and how do you know that and so on and um this is giving away a little bit of a secret but uh, that's okay i mean it's publicly available information so um there are websites that summarize this kind of information there are uh, you know that are out there so you can google them i think college data and and a couple of others um you know um so you can look at that but look for the common data set every institution uh, publishes them annually, so um, they should be very easy to find on their websites. And in general, if you just like common data set uh, Harvard, um, it will come up and you'll be able to download it. And yeah, it'll take some going through because there's a lot of uh, a lot of data that is not of interest to you, but it does help you get to some of the nitty gritty of the questions you're asking. Um, and then there are websites out there that do summarize some of that data, and and we do that as well. Um, and and so you can get that information out there, and a lot of the schools will tell you right up front. So you know, um, you know, you'll be able to tell you, okay, this is what our in-state percentages, and you can, you know, you may or may not get that directly, but you can find that out. Awesome, awesome. That's super helpful. Um, we do have a few other questions for our universities that don't have a business major. Is psychology a good surrogate if economics is considered too theoretical? Um, look, again, you know, I'll give you an example. In my MBA program, one of my uh, colleagues was an undergraduate in nutritional biology, and she was doing an MBA in marketing. And the minute she graduated, uh, NutraSuite flew her up to uh, uh, their corporate headquarters and hired her. So um, that tells you that the business world is very adaptable to undergraduate majors. But again, it's what you make of any opportunity. I mean, I was an economics major, but I had enough credits that I could have Theoretically, if I took a few more courses, actually double majored in either computer science, math, or religion. Um, so you can, you can, you know, most colleges will even allow you to design a major. So you could look at psychology with a secondary emphasis, um, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's hard to give you blanket answers because I don't know the young person. I don't know uh, a lot of things. And as a counselor, I'm very scared to give blanket answers to questions like this uh, because every every young person is so unique in every goal that they have so in general i think you could do that uh but i think it really does uh merit uh, you know at least the high school counselor getting involved you doing more research on the different programs that are available at the institutions that you are considering for uh your son or daughter so um, Austin, that's really helpful. Um, I just want to let everyone, everyone know that there is going to be a recording that's going to be emailed to you tomorrow. Um, so if you were asking about the recording, you will get that. Um, and then I also um, wanted to, you know, there are a few more questions here. One of a few people were asking about that website that you mentioned um, that helps yeah. find volunteering opportunities. Yeah. It's like universe, except it's Zooniverse. It's Z -O -O N iverse i-v-e-r-s-e and there are many others by the way i mean that's off the top of my head that's the one that came to mind but there are others as well but zooniverse is is interesting because it not only gives you projects you can get involved in it allows you to create projects that others can get involved in so take a look at it awesome awesome great we can go through and see if there are any other questions we can here. I think there's a question about IB that I'd like to answer. Yeah. Um, 
so the question was does the ib diploma help a lot um what you should know is that often colleges will give college credit uh for ib programs um if you have the diploma um not for ib courses that you took but if you're a diploma candidate you could theoretically get credit as you would with scores of five or maybe even some cases four on the ap test you could theoretically get college credit replacement um the courses obviously that you know again we we uh, the question was what courses should they take well for the diploma they take higher level courses and standard level courses so if you're taking higher level courses such as math and quantitative uh things and english that would be helpful uh, rather than taking math at a standard level for business um so but yes the ib is a great program and um, you know colleges do look at it favorably uh, of course you need sixes and sevens preferably sevens on your grades because the ib ranking goes from one to seven uh, so obviously the more sevens you have the better it is um, and of course it matters what you took as your higher level courses as opposed to standard levels so that's that's important awesome awesome that was super helpful um I see one question that was asking about how um, the SAT um, being optional in some places now and kind of how that affects students when they're figuring out their list of reach and target and safety schools and how to factor that in um, or what recommendations you have on that. Look, um, this is a very, very tough area for young people and for admissions officers. Um, when you go SAT optional, it necessarily puts a lot of pressure on the rest of your application, right? And and so what happens is that if you take that one factor out, and it may not be a determining factor from most universities in their admissions process anyway. So even if you you know if you're applying, and the SAT is is a factor, but it it won't be the determining factor. But what it does is it removes one piece that kind of people can look at that is across the board all, and all applicants. So what that ends up doing is putting more pressure on the academic record, the curriculum, the grades, um, the course selections, the AP scores, and then also on the extracurriculars and other areas. So your application kind of has to show uh, strength in that, but that you have to do anyway, really. So, and it also depends on which schools you're talking about, you know? And so um, on the highly competitive side, um, and and you know it's a, it's a hard thing to say because uh, increasingly colleges are going back to not being test optional uh so uh, i think you know depending on whether the student is in, well a senior should have already been through the process if you're a junior or a sophomore your strategies will change depending on the number of institutions that remain test optional which some will um so the rule of thumb is that, you know, do whatever you can in the circumstances you have. You have a solid test score, go ahead and send it uh, relative to the places you're applying to. Um, and, you know, I think that you just have to, uh, every, as I said, you know, blanket answers to questions like this are very difficult to give because there may be circumstances in which we advise a student to send the score or not send the score that external to what the college is about. It's more about the, what the student is about. As counselors, we focus on the student rather than the institution, although the institution does matter, of course. Um, but there's so many things that go into a young person's application that it's very hard to pick one thing as sort of a litmus test of any sort. Um, so what might be a reach school for one, maybe um, a target for another and, and, and so on. And depending on a lot of factors as we've gone through there, there you know, there's, uh, there's tons of things that admissions officers look at, and it's a very human process and a complex one at that. Um, so, uh, you know, I've given you a, a sort of a generic and general answer, uh, but it's I think it has to be in, evaluated on an individual basis, and hopefully you have a good counselor working with you that can guide you with that. Awesome. That was super helpful. Um, that was a really great answer. It's a very tough um, question too. Um, there's another student that was asking their high school is moving away from APs. Um, would that be a disadvantage for the applications? Um, or what do you think on that topic? Well, look, again, you can only do within the environment what you have the opportunity to do. So if your high school doesn't offer APs, 
Um, you know, again, let me just say this is, this, these are very unique situations, right? I have a young person, for example, whose high school does not offer AP psychology. So she's, she's planning to do it on her own. Right. So she is pushing herself and, and she goes to an exceptional school that offers a ton of APs. They just don't happen to offer that one that she's interested in. Uh, so she's taking the initiative uh, to do it on her own. Right. So you can do things like that. Uh, but on the other hand, um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do think not having an AP could be something that universities look at. However, if the school doesn't offer them, then they have to factor that in. And then the question is, how do they evaluate your academic record relative to others? And then it becomes an inexact science. Uh, so I, again, as I go, you know, I sound like a broken record and I, I, it seems like I'm dodging the question, but, you know, as a counselor, it's my responsibility to make sure that I, you know, I, I put the caveat in there because when I know more about the young person, then maybe I can give a better answer. But for now, that is my, the best answer I can give. Uh, given what I know, um, you know, so it could be, you know, they, they could be very important, uh, you know, it could be a very important factor, or it could be a non-factor given other ways that the student has demonstrated academic strength, um, you know, and that's where, you know, taking some, some of the summer programs or other courses, demonstrating academic strength in other ways come in. And so, um, you know, uh, that's the best I can do with that one. But again, you can only do what you can do within the environment that you're given. And if you push yourself within that environment, then fair enough. Awesome. Awesome. That's very helpful as well. Awesome. Okay, we can see if there's any more questions here. Okay, uh, let me just answer one question about AP credits. Uh, so AP credits take two forms, and it depends on the school. Uh, you know, first, it depends on the score you have, whether or not the school will grant, whether they have a policy of granting credits. Um, and some will grant credits, which actually do count towards graduation, and others will place you. So for example, you don't have to take the introductory level math course or the introductory level economics course, and you can place out of it. That just means you go to a higher level course. That doesn't mean that it reduces the number of credits you have to take. However, in some cases, like an IB program, or for example, in case of my kids at my school in Pakistan, they take the A-level, um, which is the 13th year of education. Some of them actually get a year worth of credit towards uh, you know, universities. The problem with that is that it does eat up a lot of electives in some cases. So if you want to explore a double major, you want to look at some things that might mean that you're limited in that. So be careful about that. I mean, yes, it does. It can possibly mean that you can finish um earlier as you can if you take summer school or whatever so if you can accumulate enough credits to graduate and meet all the requirements sure you can graduate earlier but again every situation is different every college is different with respect to their policies um you know for what they give credit for and how much credit they give uh, you know whether it's selective credit whether it's specific credit uh, whether it helps you satisfy distribution requirements or not so it's not a you know, it's not a one size fits all answer. Uh, but yes, in general, if you get credit for your AP or IB or A level, that will count towards graduation and could mean that you could finish the degree one semester or even a year early. Uh, but every case is different. Awesome. Awesome. That was super helpful. Okay. I think that um, that is about that covers majority of the questions. There are so many. Um, did you have any other questions um, or any other input or advice um, before we sign off for you? Um, well, I, yeah, I mean, this is, again, um, putting on my admissions officer hat in the conversations I used to have with parents and students uh, when they applied. Look, the application process is by definition a very, very, stressful endeavor uh, for young people. You can you can plan for your your you know ninth, tenth, and eleventh grade and and apply and do your best. And once you do your best, uh, you know, then you have to let the admissions team do their work. And um, you know, these are human beings who are very committed to their work and they do their best. And in many cases, 
Uh, they're making incredibly tough decisions between some really talented young people, and it just comes down to numbers. And it's not a referendum on your ability or your potential to be successful. In a lot of cases, um, all the students we would turn down at Georgetown, or most of them, uh, would have done really well if they had come to Georgetown. It's just that you know we're we were limited by numbers, and that's true of every institution. Um, and I have had the good fortune of having conversations with people like uh, Bill Fitzsimmons of Harvard and and Christoph Gutentag of Penn, who was an associate at uh, Penn. That's why I say Penn because he's now he's been dean of admissions at Duke for many many years. But we, we've had conversations over the years about the wonderful young people that we read every year, and um, it's, a, it's an incredibly tough job to choose between some wonderful candidates. So um, the decisions that are made and the decisions you receive, positive or negative, uh, should not be viewed as a, referen a referendum on your potential or an indication of whether or not you were good enough. Most of you are plenty good enough. Um, it's just you know, just simply the numbers, the competition has exploded, even Georgetown. I mean, you know, if you look at the admit rate when I was there in the 1990s compared to now has changed. Harvard, yeah, every every place has seen an explosion in applications. So the competition is higher, but that does not diminish the accomplishments of young people or their potential. Um, you will find a place for yourself. Uh, focus on the match rather than um the individual success or failure of an admissions application um do your best we've given you some guidelines here i'm sure your counselors your parents and others well wishers will guide you uh you can all add you can only do your best and 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 try to find a place and you know i didn't go to an IVB league school uh but i got a great education which inspired me to be an educator um and that's all i can tell you is my own example and uh, and so i'm pretty happy with where i am in life thankfully and uh, i think everyone if you keep a positive attitude um, i know the application process is stressful but um, you know let's just let's just hope that you can find ways to see the good in the decisions you get and sometimes they'll go for you and sometimes they won't but it has as i said my final word is you are still going to be successful if you work hard and do your best and uh, don't let a college decision affect that part of who you are awesome. that's that my final so word helpful. that was so helpful Raheel. um thank you everyone so much for tuning in tonight and joining us if you have any questions feel free to um send us an email again um you'll actually get a recording of the webinar tomorrow if you missed any parts of it um but Thank you all for joining. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your night. Um, thank you so much, Raheel. Um, and thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jillian. I appreciate the opportunity. And thank you for keeping us uh, organized and on track. So awesome. thank you. Thank you so much, of course. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye.